you don't want to give anything on that canvas that doesn't need to be there. It's very easy to add, add, add stuff, but it doesn't, it doesn't add any value. Um, I, I mentioned earlier that anything you do, you need to make sure that it adds value to the sales process or to the individual salesperson who's using it. This is Sales Ops Demystified, the number one most downloaded podcast in sales operations. We invite the brightest minds in sales ops onto the show to deconstruct the what, why, and how behind rep productivity, forecasting, metrics, and all things revenue. This podcast is brought to you by EBSA, a revenue intelligence platform used to identify risk in the pipeline and score customer engagement and is sponsored by the Global Sales Operations Association and the UK Revenue Operations Network. Hello. And welcome to another very special episode of the Sales Ops Demystified podcast. Today, we're joined by Yanni Levenen, who is the Director of Sales Effectiveness at Iron Mountain. Yanni, welcome to the show. Thanks very much and good to be on the show. Incredible. So you have, I believe, approximately 13 years experience in sales operations. Is, is that accurate? Um, yeah, I think it's about 13, 15 years, depending how you count it. So yeah, quite a long time of looking data and processes uh, across the different companies. So you must have been in sales ops like before sales ops was like a thing almost, because in the last like three to five years, it really has become a thing. Have you seen that shift? Oh, absolutely. It's, it's, it's a really interesting point. So I remember when I kind of started my, my path in sales ops, um, it was with Getty Images then, and um, it was it was quite fascinating. It was something new. Um, it was a combination of different things, looking the effectiveness and efficiencies. Uh, but I fully agree. In in couple of uh, last couple of years, the the whole term of sales operations or sales effectiveness has is just boomed, and it's becoming much more common, even for smaller enterprises. So let's just dig into that, this definitional point first. The, the difference between sales ops and sales effectiveness, I know you are a director of sales effectiveness. Do, does that sit within sales operations? Is it separate? Like, why the different name? Uh, it's, it's a good point. I think it's um, um, the best loved child has a plenty of different names. And um, how I like to define it, that sales effectiveness is almost your umbrella that covers all the different elements that improve the sales. So sales operations sales enablement, um, commission and compensation, and then your um, analytics and insights. Um, and the effectiveness umbrella um, kind of oversees all those different elements. Makes sense. Um, I want to go back to the start of your career. So it was Getty Images, and I think you were, you were there for around 10 years. Um, what were the, That's and this might be a tricky yeah. question, but what were the sales-related initiatives that you are, were most proud of? Could you just give us one example? Oh, gosh, one example. Um, I probably would say one of my proudest um, things within Get Images was um, um, sales transformation um, when times got a bit tougher and we really reanalyzed how we were servicing our customers around the world and what kind of sales structure we had across the different sales teams. Makes sense. And then we've kind of moved over to, to Iron Mountain. And I would want to ask the same question now is in about three to four years, I think, um, what has been the thing that you have implemented or the, the challenge that you've overcome that, you're most, that you think has had the biggest impact? I think there's been a number of different things Iron Mountain. Um, myself and as a team, we've been implementing. Iron Mountain as a company has been going through a fair amount of change and lots of it been... We've been pushing to change internally um, to make the company more effective and more efficient, not just from the sales point of view, but uh, holistically as a company. And uh, of course, the pandemic has boosted even our path, even um, fast forwarding some of the projects. 
A um, couple of things that are uh, significant. We, in our sales enablement site, we we globalizing our whole training, induction, and the assets what sales have access to. Um, it's, it's quite difficult to run a global sales enablement function as a, from kind of L&D point of view. So we introduced a um, very clever tiering model where the different countries are tiered on different levels, and that then um, gives them access to different level of um, assets, depending on what they need. And it's really kind of helping to focus that we don't overload the sales guys, because that's been... I think one of the challenges during the pandemic that people are overloading their sales teams because we're all thinking, oh, they need more information, they need more information, but it's coming this total, uh, you're so saturated information that you can't, you can't um, eat anymore. You just, you just black out. The other thing which we're working at the moment is one of my favorite challenges is we're globalizing our commissions and compensation accounting, um, really bringing um, transparency for the sales guys, not just looking from the company point of view, how much we're spending money on commissions and um, how our comp plan works around the world, but bringing simplicity and clarity to the sales teams around the world in a time when there's so much uncertainty on everything else and how sales operations can really drive that um, job satisfaction of through um, simplicity and clarity. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I, I also, I think both of those are slightly connected. So they're not overloading your salespeople, but also having a very clear and simple compensation system. It's almost like we need to get out of the way of the sales reps a little bit more to do what they do best while, while still being there to ensure that they're going to get paid and to ensure that they have resources base. We, we don't want to hold their hand too much. So that's the sense I'm getting. Oh, absolutely. And uh, I, I quite often refer sales jobs in my own mind as a it's the oil in the engine because when you've got well-oiled engine, um, it just happens. Everything works and uh, the whole cockwork moves so um, smoothly. But if you if you if you let the oil to get sticky and rusty, the whole engine grinds to halt. And when you're having sales subs as that oil of the engine, they're really making sure that the sales teams know what they're doing and supporting them along the route. They have the inside data. The processes work. It all just works. It happens like magic. <laughs> it's it's not as easy as it sounds, of course. But um, it, it's uh, I think quite often when sales shops work perfectly, you, nobody realizes the existence of department. But when things start going wrong, um, then people say, "Oh, oi, oi, where's my sales shops business partner?" Got it. So, so we actually kind of want the sales shops team to be almost invisible all the time. Uh, yeah, theoretically, yes, because um, hopefully things work so well that you don't you don't have those crisis meetings or things falling apart when you you need to um, do firefighting. I mean, in the ideal world, there's no firefighting. I mean, it happens a lot in sales world, um, but ideally, it would be amazing if things could happen. I think there's another kind of visual image that um, I like is when you're thinking that sales ops and sales enablement are your stage managers in a, in a theater. You've got your salespeople are the actors and you might have your product management doing all the sets and lighting and the sales ops are pulling up and down the ropes so the lights go on and the sets come up and down. They're not on the show, but they're incredibly important part of the show behind the scenes. Very good analogies. I love analogies. They just make it so clear of what the sales ops function should be. Could we just have a little bit more detail about the, the Iron Mountain sales effectiveness slash ops function, e.g. how many people in the team, who you guys report to, and also how many reps you are uh, responsible for? Yeah, happy to dive into a bit of a kind of meat around the bones. So how we, we structured our team um, across the world is that we, we have regional um, directors for sales operations. So uh, making sure that we have that kind of regional understanding and insights what's going on and we can react quickly. So we have regional director for um, Asia Pacific, um, Europe, Middle East, Africa, and then North and South America. So three regional directors. Um, then myself, um, I at the moment head special project and the kind of uh, redesign of our compensation and commission team. So taking a slightly different role my role to known is a global, so I oversee all our operating countries around the world. And then similarly, my colleague um, 
who's our director for sales enablement, he's got a global role. So he's leading our global enablement strategy, how we really train teams and really focusing just like myself on that kind of global scaling, how we can use technology stack um, and online tools to make sure that we can provide as much, as much in local languages where possible, but in a global scale. Um, and we also have a director of analytics and insights who then provides us a global level of reporting and insights uh, on different projects. We all kind of directors, we report currently to VP of revenue operations. We had a little change there recently. So we merged our revenue management team and sales operations and sales and event teams under VP of revenue operations. So we have a more holistic kind of commercial view of what's happening in the company. Um, when we're looking to team sizes then around the world, we've got roughly, um, I would say about 1,300 um, sales reps um, around the world. It really varies country by country. We have countries where we've got two sales reps to countries where we have 600 sales reps. So there's, there's huge differences on, on the countries. And um, our go-to-market strategy is fairly similar in most of the countries. So uh, we, we are in midst of redefining it and simplifying it. Some of it has been pushed by COVID because the, the way our customers and clients are working is really driving our go-to-market strategy. Um, we, we used to have a much larger quantities of uh, probably field reps um, historically. We are now making sure that those customers who need field rep, they have access to field rep, but those who don't really need one, uh, we are creating more inside sales um, rep type of roles um, around the world. Awesome. And then it would be great just to hear a little bit about the sales tech stack as well. Tech stack, I, I, I think is a, it's something that everyone's always really excited. Um, our core platform, we're running on Salesforce. It's the core platform for the sales um, teams. We've got flurry of different apps on top of Salesforce, um, varying from um, third-party data integrations, providing additional data. Um, companies like we've got um, LinkedIn pushed in. We've got Salesforce Einstein. Um, I think there's a Dun & Bradstreet. We've got Zoom Info. Lots of these kind of data providing data for our sales guys so they know what they're doing. We're also linking our um, revenue management so the pricing tools are linked into our opportunities. So the system is automatically providing guidelines on the pricing um, when they're negotiating on contracts and opportunities. So the salesperson doesn't have to be doing the research. The systems provide automatically that insight, what is the right price <laughs> or what, what is kind of the, the um, what I should be aiming to on different products or service groups. Um, we also use marketing automation tools um, that provide our lead management. So they all live in a kind of marketing world in our marketing operations, but they all link directly in. Um, one of the new platforms we are currently our incentive compensation management platform doesn't link to Salesforce, which is a bit of a shame. And hence, I'm I'm in progress at the moment getting brand new ICM platform globally that will then link to um, Salesforce as well. So, I think our tech stack is quite heavy, um, but what we're constantly focusing on that the user interface for the sales rep is simple. There's a, there's a clarity, there's a logic behind it. So you know what you're looking for, you know what you're supposed to do. Um, it's, I, I, I sit in our steering committees for, for Salesforce from a sales cloud point of view. And one of my mantras is that I'm probably the person everyone knows I'm going to decline every single new feature because for me, it's like, it's like iPhone. You don't need to read the instruction manual for iPhone. You pick it up, you know how to use it. Any sales tool should be the same way. You pick it up, you know what you're supposed to do. Yeah, some things might be trickier because it's you're creating complex solutions for the client, but it shouldn't be so complex that you need to start reading a manual. How do I convert a lead to an opportunity or how I convert opportunity to a contract? No, it should be enough intuitive um, that you can use the tools. And it, it always need, there needs to be the value. There needs to be the benefit for the sales guy to do something on the platform or otherwise it's, it's not working. 
Makes total sense. Final question from me is, who in the world of sales ops would you most like to take for lunch? Oh, I was expecting that question, Tom. Um, and I was thinking about it earlier today. Who would it be? And I realized, actually, it's my own team. I haven't seen my team for two, nearly two years. I would love to just get them all together, take them out for big uh, lunch or dinner in Boston, um, probably seafood and just have a good old jolly and uh, share all the stories from two years. That is a beautiful answer. Alex, over to you. Thanks very much, Tom. And, and thanks, Jenny. That was, that was amazing. I, I kept getting distracted thinking, I can't just enjoy what you're saying. I've got to think of some follow-up questions. Um, but the beauty of so much of what you're saying is it, is that it was in the simplicity of how you explained it. And so there were things I love, but I, I think diving into them further would, would just be to dilute the strength of what you've already said. I mean, I love the, the, the sales ops, and, uh, the oil in the engine and the, the stage hand analogies. That was already helpful. But, but one of the things is, like, you know, and I think this is because this is the focus of what you're, you're doing and in your role, which might be really interesting for the audience, is, is focusing on this sort of globalized training. You know, because Tom was alluding to, you know, sales ops is a, you know, a, in, in the public kind of sense, is, is, is more of a, a more recent kind of role, and therefore it's, it's very big in the sort of the startup community and people that you know will be more more geographically focused and looking to expand. So I think some of your some more insights on on how you've approached you know, running a globalized team um, would be really interesting. I, I think Alex is fantastic question, and I think this sometimes concerns people. Think sales ops needs to be huge function, and then my company can't afford to have a full blown up um, sales operations function, but it doesn't have to be that way. You can, you can start from small. So um, you can have that one sales ops business partner. I think the key on um, is where you position the role as well. My personal view is never should be reporting to the um, sales director or the commercial director, because then you, you're not objective because your, your boss is then dictating, oh, I don't want to see those numbers. Can you run me these numbers? Or can you give me insight on this? Like, hold on. No, let me give you insight what you should be doing or what direction we should be. And this story is not always pretty, but then you're really having honest conversations. And when you're starting on a, a let's say, a one-man band or you have a small team for sales ops, you can make the the room a bit wider. And I think when we talk about globalization and how sales ops can help the smaller companies, it's absolutely the simplicity and clarity and scalability. I think those are my, my key words I keep repeating to everyone. Anyone's asking me the question, because when you, as a small company, you start building your tech stack or you start creating new ideas, we so easily, especially during acquisitions, we leave little platforms running here and on the right-hand side or or someone buys an app, oh, this is a really cool app. It doesn't reintegrate with anything, but let's use it. And because it doesn't integrate, oh, it doesn't work on this currency. Well, let's get a different app for France, or let's get a different app, app for Brazil. When you have a person who is your, the oil in the engine, or the guy who has to go, or the lady who's your traffic police in the traffic lights, who needs to approve all these kind of business decisions, I'm not I'm not, when I'm saying approve, not saying yay or nay, but being part of the conversation. Suddenly, you have a bit of a control over your whole global tech strategy, um, how you're creating the sales process. Um, I think the, another kind of visual image is that if you start creating that everything is run by exception, even if you've got 10 countries in Europe or 10 countries in LATAM, it's incredibly difficult to run management information, to do training, if you just allow every country to be in individual. But if you think that we're all one company and your foundation becomes the key thing, and then top of the foundation, you add those cherries on the top, which are your local culture, your local operating uh, ways, the local contracting, suddenly the base of the information is standard. And you can do so much, even as a small company, when you start expanding and growing, when you keep the foundation the same around the world, life becomes so much easier. You don't need to add headcount in every country because you can scale. You don't have to hire a multitude of different things because you can scale the foundation. 
and it's just adding, for example, languages on the top or something similar. Amazing. Thank you. That, that was really, really helpful. And because um, the other thing, obviously, that, that you kept going on, as you said, you're known for talking about simplicity. And, and I also loved, loved the iPhone analogy. Even as an Android user, I, I love that <laughs> slide. <laughs> but what I think of simplicity is, is everyone knows it when we see it, but designing it is super hard. Now, it oh. sounds like you've spent a long time being the champion for simplicity. So I'd love to hear some tips around how you kind of, you sort of solve for simplicity, so to speak. Oh, it's 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 really fascinating topic, and I've I've been I've been really privileged to be involved. Um, I was for a couple of years. I was sitting in the customer advisory board for Salesforce as well when they were launching new things. And I think the interesting thing about simplicity is that when you're looking any page layout, being your customer facing or being internal CRM page, regardless of platform you're using, if there's a field that you cannot justify why it's there or what even, what is it used for? Or if you run data and you realize nobody's using the field, take it out. Actually, just take it out. If you need to have a hidden calculation value to provide you insight, don't show it to the sales guys. If it's your reporting, is it finance wants to know something, it's not supposed to be on a page layout. You don't want to give anything on that canvas that doesn't need to be there. Um, it's very easy to add, add, add stuff, but it doesn't, it doesn't add any value. Um, I, I mentioned earlier that anything you do, you need to make sure that it adds value to the sales process or to the individual salesperson who's using it. If, if you're asking information from the salesperson, or even if it's a self-service platform for the client, and you're asking information that is more likely to confuse the person, they are more likely not to use that field. And then you, you already wasted the point. What, why are you using asking something that nobody knows what it is? And because the more you're adding stones along the way on the path, the longer and harder the whole path becomes and more aggravated the person becomes by the end of the path they get there. You can have one or two little um, missteps there, but if you've got constant missteps, you have to constantly stop and read and understand what you're doing. It's not going to work. The other thing, which is I always think is incredibly important, is grouping the information in a logical manner. Don't just add questions or information boxes in random um, way on your. And it, it goes across everything you do. It's again, thinking as a painting. If if this is your, uh, or I think it is a recipe almost. The first things you need to know is your key ingredients. Then you need to know how do you mix it together and how do you bake it. You don't want to start with the, the uh, mixing if you don't even know what you're mixing in. Um, and it's just keeping things in a simple, logical flow. Um, I love sometimes just asking random people on, on changes, what do you think about this? And they say, well, I don't know the background for this. They're like, I don't care. But if you would read this, does it make sense? And people, if they say yes, five minutes, like, I really don't understand this question. It's like, okay, so the question is wrong. Oh, no, no, it's probably because I don't know the, the industry. It's like, no, that's not industry related question. It's asking your email address. If you don't know how to type email address, the question is clearly incorrect. Um, sometimes simplicity and clarity is not rocket science, but I think we, we make it sound rocket science because we overcomplicate something that should be so simple. Brilliant. Thank you so much. That, that, that was really, really helpful. And um, I'm already buzzing to go away and sort of have a bit of time to myself, just thinking about how I can apply some of these things in, in my area. So thank you very much, Yanni. No, brilliant. All right, Yanni. So the, the things that I think really stuck out to me and Alex, based on Alex's feedback there, is kind of the number of simplification analogies. So I've got a couple written down here. So sales ops being the stage manager, just off, like not on show, but incredibly important or sales ops being the oil of the cogs to ensure that the system is working fine, sales ops being invisible, and also uh, having sales tech uh, almost like an iPhone, it, we shouldn't have to have a user's manual. And so those are the things that, that we've taken away and we'll highlight uh, in all the, the title and all the content around this post. So Yanni, thank you so much for, for coming on and sharing your wisdom. Brilliant. Thanks very much for inviting me. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Sales Ops Demystified podcast. If you are listening on a podcast listening application, then please subscribe, rate, and review 
And if you have any questions about the show, if you know a guest or if you have any questions about sales operations, just hit me up at tomhunt at ebster.com. That's tomhunt at ebster.com. Thank you.